So I thought long and hard what we should do for the next 50 minutes, plus or minus an hour. I decided what would be more appropriate than having a journal club? <laughs> for those of you that never experienced a journal club, it goes something like this. Somebody prepares really hard the material for the journal club, comes to present it to a group of scholars and myself, and gets about through one slide, and then that's it. <laughs> See, I did pay attention to what I do. <laughs> but as Jeff Weiss knows, um, I never can change what I do. So the bottom line is that uh, I do pay attention. So I thought we would try to do that today. And um, my goal is to make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, period, end of sentence. Um, it's a good experience. It gets all the hormones flowing and you may live an extra year if you get stimulated a little bit as opposed to sitting still for 19 hours. So my goal is to make you feel a little uncomfortable, uh, maybe get you to do something different that you wouldn't have done because you were a little scared to do it uh, before uh, you heard this, uh, or maybe not. And I'm going to start with um, a couple of things. First, um, it's great seeing you all, especially those that I haven't seen, though I have a problem. And that I recently saw again the beautiful mind. Uh, in the beautiful mind, Jonathan Nash has hallucinations. And he finally can decide whether or not he's having a hallucination or not because the girl in his hallucination stays eight years old. And he realizes that he's gotten older and therefore, this is a hallucination, and he can control it a little bit. Ken, the psychiatrist, could tell me whether that's full of bunk, but the bottom line is that's what he does, and that's what the movie says. Um, I'm uh, somewhat disappointed that I have to have a new picture of you all, much older than you were the last time I saw you. <laughs> uh, but the good thing about it is most of you have brought pictures of your children, because remember, the contract with becoming a clinical scholar was producing offspring. Uh, everything else was irrelevant. Uh, and Carol, when she became co-director of the program, kept telling me I was inappropriate from an HR standpoint, but she never reported me, which was uh, her issue, not mine. Um, so the bottom line is, however, that um, your pictures of your offspring look exactly like you did when you were clinical scholars. So um, the program has to be around long enough for them to become clinical scholars so that uh, we can go forward uh, in the future with a new generation of really bright, enthusiastic uh, people. Now, um, I'm going to start with two things. Tom Rockwell, I think, I hopefully rolled into the room. Uh, he's back in the back. Tom, you ought to meet before he, le he, he, he leaves. He's from Rand. He's a physician. He's the one that actually found me in the basement of a building somewhere in Washington, D.C. in 1972 or 73, and actually was the reason I'm at UCLA and Rand. There are a lot of other people that I'll talk about tonight for a few minutes about that. But he actually found me. Uh, you may want to, and it was luck probably that he found me, uh, but uh, that's why I'm here and not somewhere else. I'm going to give, begin with a story. The story I'm going to give, begin with is uh, when I was a medical student in 1965, and I was looking at the glue sniffing epidemic in Baltimore County. And what my job was, was to go out to the police department of Baltimore County, where all the detectives had a big common room, and go through thousands of records of kids that were picked up for glue sniffing to produce the epidemiology of glue sniffing. Um, while I was sitting there and became part of the wall, the following story occurred. A detective said to the group of other, about 25 other detectives, um, we on last Christmas had to give up our Christmas and go down to a small town in Virginia and we had to go across the Skyline Drive to pick up a prisoner and bring that prisoner back to Baltimore. Um, we were pissed off. Sorry for the language, we have to edit it from the tape, but we were pissed off. So on the way back, we took our prisoner, took all the clothes off the prisoner, tied the hands together with handcuffs and the feet together with rope, opened all our windows, 
put on our leather jackets and drove down the Skyline Drive, for those of you that have driven it, it's beautiful in the summer, while it was snowing, back to Baltimore. Now, why do I tell this story? I did nothing at all about it. Never did anything about it. So my first question to you is, what stories do you have that you've never told anybody or done anything about? And wouldn't it be brilliant if Martin Shapiro, who's leaving us unfortunately, and Joel Braslow, who are two of our historians, maybe with a couple of anthropologists, put all our stories together. We've all been very brave, we've been very courageous, but I'm sure we have things that we haven't told that we would have liked to do something about. What if we put them together in a book, or maybe Facebook, or maybe something else? What about the stories and the things we saw that we did not act on or do anything about? That might be a nice beginning of the future. So what is the future about? I am going to say that we need three assumptions, and uh, these are the assumptions. So will humans exist? If you don't believe that, and some of you may not by the year 2043, then you're doing health services research for humpback whales <laughs> or Greenlander sharks that live 400 years or redwood trees that live thousands of years. Will humans exist? And I'm serious. When I began this program in 1974 or 75, I can't remember when, I never would have asked this question never would have asked this question, because what I believed was the sun would last for a billion years, and except for an occasional nuclear bomb that we may throw at each other, uh, we would exist, we'd be here. I don't know how many of you believe that we will exist. You must, because you've committed yourself to children and some of you to grandchildren. Second of all, will most cities won't be underwater, or will they be underwater? Think about it. What are you designing your work for? What proportion of the landmass of this world will be underwater? By 2043, that's going to be the heart of the time that you spend, or maybe a little bit later. And third, will women be immortal? If you believe that, then men won't exist. Because those of you that remember basic biology, species that are immortal don't need sexual reproduction. They just divide or do something, whatever immortality means. Now again, any one of these three assumptions about the future, if you don't believe it, that you know, there will not be immortality, that we will still have men and women, and we will still have most of our cities, changes what your work will mean and what this field ought to do in the future. Now, it's also obvious that all three of these assumptions depend upon thinking about the world as one community. When I began this program, or when we began this program, it was quite all right for RWJ to talk about helping America get better and they couldn't fund anything, and we worked on huge arrangements to get people funded who wanted to do international work. Uh, I can't tell you how we gave Martin Shapiro tickets to go to Mozambique to study you know, colonial powers and, and Portugal and what happened in the turn of last century to people that were in the mines, but it was not by giving him a direct ticket that involved going overseas. Now, everything you do has to have global impact. What do I mean by that? Whatever you discover, whatever you do, you ought to try to figure out whether the worst off people in the world could benefit from what you've done. Make the extra effort to answer that question. Vice versa, when you pick problems to look at, 
maybe you ought to pick problems that will affect people beyond the shores of the U.S. of A. Now, a few thoughts about the human race. As you know, I believe you all need, especially as we go to an, inter an interprofessional program, a intellectual content of this program. I'm going to suggest at the end books that you all all read. So you thought you were coming here and just getting a good dinner and lunch and meeting old friends, but you know you really have to do something. You got to read *Sapiens*. Now, um, Joel Braslow, our clinical scholar, has married a figure who's godlike. What can I tell you, Joel, if you're still here? Uh, how is it being married to God? Now, what I mean, I don't mean that she's a woman or not. That's another story, and I won't go there because Carol will get angry again. But she's a basic scientist, a world-renowned basic scientist. And we are simply in the process of acting and doing things that I would have considered being God when I began this program. Think about a child one and a half years old. What does that child consider to be life? What is life to a child? Well, something that moves, right? Something that reacts. So R2-D2 is life, right? We've changed life. Maybe not to a sophisticated clinical scholar, but how about their one and a half year old child? What do we have to do to increase our game to make it appear to the clinical scholar that life as we know it is different? So first of all, we're godlike. Second of all, we don't know what we want to do. I have a daughter who's a hospitalist here. Her, one of our best friends just gave her a guitar. California's gonna pass a law in two months that basically legalizes marijuana. If she decides that she wants to go to the desert, smoke a joint or two, play a guitar, sing a song, give up the notion of being a hospitalist, I don't think her mother will be very happy. <laughs> We're dangerous because we are godlike, we don't know what we want, and that makes us dangerous. And we are going through a period of the human race where we have to up our game dramatically if we're not going to exterminate it. Now here is an interesting definition of a rabbi. Is this the purpose of what we want? To redress the grievances of those who are abandoned or alone, to protect the dignity of the poor, save the oppressed from the hands of the oppressor, and who will end, add, to eliminate the teaching of hate to our children. Now, second agenda. Why don't you as a group come together and decide what is the purpose of what we're about? This may not be what you believe. This may not be very good. Wouldn't it be interesting to do that exercise as a group? Wouldn't it be interested if all health professionals had to come together and actually do it together so that we begin to develop a culture of respect and trust? It's not the question of having coursework together. It's the question of actually respecting and trusting people as Ken and Loretta and others have taught us. Now, what do I want in terms of health? So I'm gonna get a little parochial because I have to get something down to what could be something that's useful. Uh, this is a book I read. This was supposed to be the subject of Journal Club. I sent it to all of you. You probably didn't get it. If you got it, you didn't read it. Um, so the bottom line is that um, I'm not sending you another copy. You can download it free from Amazon or Kindle. It's free, therefore you won't download it because you don't have to pay anything, so what can I tell you? But what do I want in terms of science? Will basic science make us all immortal? Will we eliminate social determinants of health? What's the balance between the two? At a recent meeting of the National Academy of Medicine on a mixed panel, I raised the question of who's gonna win the war? Who's gonna get rid of the disparities that we are talking about first? The basic scientist or the everybody else? 
And I don't think they understood the question or the NIH answered it in a politically correct way. We need both. Okay. So health services research over the last 50 years has taught us a lot. Um, and I want to just figure out what are the, some of the main things that it's taught us and try to figure out what we have to do about it in the future or what basically you need to do about it in the future. So first thing we know is how to measure health status. Now, we know it's measurable. We know it's all-encompassing. We know depression leads to morbidity. And now the question is, the ability to measure raises uncomfortable questions but great opportunities. So when I develop a new drug or a new surgical procedure, Jocelyn is operating in the room on a neurosurgical patient, um, she's trying to stop this or change this or fix this course, takes all these really sick patients and makes them better. What does health status measurement do? Well, we spent a lot of money. A lot of you were part of that movement, helped develop these measures. What has it done for us? Well, there's an occasional clinical trial that says drug A is drug better than drug B because health status of people on A versus B is better. But we have no closed loop in medicine, I think, anywhere. There is nobody, no health system, that basically trends or tracks health status measures and uses that to prevent this. We actually do almost no trending at all in medicine. It's really hard to get people to look at things that are not just done yesterday. But what if we trended health status measures? What would we do with it? Now, the old-fashioned way of measuring health status in the past was to hire Sandy Berry, who we still have teach a course in survey, and she would develop a survey and a course, and we'd use SurveyMonkey, and we'd get people not to complete forms, and we'd give them cars to Starbucks, or cards to Starbucks. Maybe we should give them cars to Starbucks. <laughs> but we give them cards to Starbucks, and they don't, still don't fill out the forms. Okay. Or we try to get doctors to say, look at health status measures. Doctors don't pay any attention. So maybe there's a difference. And maybe that's going to come out of Silicon Valley. So there's a book called Social Physics written by an MIT professor, one of the books on the list that you ought to read. What if I can measure physical, mental, and social health by just having something this big on you? I can measure how many people you talk to in a day by doing a voice print of the different people. I can measure the tone of your voice. Were you angry? I might even be able to measure your pupil size to find out whether you got an oxytocin lift by talking to your doggy. I can understand whether you've watched television for hours. All due to something really, really small. You don't fill out a questionnaire anymore. Now I couple this with big data. And all of a sudden, I have a system that knows everything about you in terms of health. I'm not sure you want it. That goes back to sapiens. But maybe we use health status this way. And maybe when I find that you're not doing something correctly, um, something happens. Maybe that something is that the community is worried about you. Not a doctor, not a nurse, but the community. That we have a community of health that we've built across racial, ethnic, and income. And people worry about you and try to keep you from getting unhealthy. And by keeping other people unhealthy, you yourself get more health. Best way to improve your own health is probably to prevent other people from becoming unhealthy. What if we did something like that? What does the world look like with all this new technology, monitoring all these new kinds of things, and what will happen? What's the role of the health professionals in this new world? So the interface of this new program with Silicon Valley, with business, with people that understand all this, now, this struck home yesterday with Dick over here. So 
Dick's cell phone doesn't work in West Los Angeles because we live in a third world country and AT&T has no signal. So he used my landline to call his home. Okay, that's not exciting. That actually worked, even though he said his wife wouldn't pick up the phone call because it was a strange number and he would never pick up the phone call. Okay, she picked up the phone call. But then he picked up his iPad and it showed on the iPad that he had missed a call from Robert Brooke. Now he doesn't have me in his contact file. He doesn't have that phone number in his contact file. How in the heck did that happen? I asked him. He's too old to answer the question correctly. <laughs> I'm too old to answer the question correctly. A couple of people in the room may know it. Jason, Josh, if he's here, others may know. How did that happen? What really, I'm not, the phone is not even listed. It's the second line on our phone. The first line is what's listed in the phone book. What's happened here? So you just have to imagine what people at Apple and Google and others are doing in this area. And we have to rethink the whole question of how this great invention of measuring health status is actually going to be used. Now, what do we know about quality? Here's what we know about quality. We know it's measurable. There's lots of us that can improve the measures, but basically it's measurable. It's very deficient. It varies by location, and no provider does everything well. That's what we've learned. We've spent many of your projects summarizing them all without a single number, because numbers just get in the way of information. So, you know, no numbers, just here we are. This is what we know. Now, again, same question. So if it were you, what do you do about it? So let me tell you another story about how I got thrown out of another committee meeting. So <laughs> Department of Medicine goes over the grades the, on the boards by specialty. Okay? These are godlike, brilliant people. And they look at it and they say, well, the one on the bottom is, pick a specialty, pulmonology. They must be doing terribly. And I'm trying to explain to them basic statistics that somebody has to be on the bottom. Somebody has to be on the top. Doesn't matter, there may be no difference. Maybe all random luck. But the question is, they wanted to focus on the distribution. But the real question is as follows. If you really believe that you train people and some people are better than others in the skills that you're training them, but all of them are going to become doctors, why do you take the best ones for the next level of programs? It's different when you're talking about a clinical scholar program, I think. But if you're talking about a program that's going to train physicians, where we want not to have increased variability of physicians or nurses, but decreased variability, why don't we insist that the people that didn't do well the first time in your institution stay with you? Why don't we develop a series of practices to reduce variability? Now again, think about how modern technology and others might go about solving this problem. Now I always wonder about the fact that a student will be really smart and say, I want to live in Boston the rest of my life, so if I can just get by at Harvard, I will be able to stay there for the rest of my life because they're committed to making me a decent doctor. We have those kinds of problems, but how do we really develop a culture of quality across all health professionals. What will you do that 30 years from now there will be no variability or very little variability in quality? And every one of you will not, come, will not be asked the question by one of your friends, who's a really good doctor or nurse and who isn't? Every one of you asked that question. What do we know about cost and use? People use more care when it's free. Free care does not equal better health. Pay affects how physicians practice. Now, some of this was stuff that I helped develop. Imagine a doctor telling the world that in order to protect your health, you've got to put up a financial payment so that they don't come see you. Because when they come see you, you're likely to produce more harm than good because you have no understanding of the reliability and validity of the clinical process that you are actually using. Isn't that what we proved? 
Think about any other organization that says if you pay more, you don't get better value. Can we fundamentally reverse this knowledge? I'm not even sure it's true today, but can we fundamentally reverse it by improving the clinical validity and reliability of the processes we use? Especially for people that come to us with not obvious severe disease where the prior probabilities of low disease makes it more likely that we will do more harm than good. Lots of stories to tell, but can we do something there? How do we prevent this? This is an example of a putting somebody in a, some sort of a machine. <laughs> I'm not sure where the opening in the machine is and whether the person has to go around the circle to get in it, but the bottom line is it's some sort of a machine. Um, we have, when you look internationally, something like um, whatever it is, 100 times the number of MRI machines per population than other countries, um, except for Japan, who tries to sell them. What do we know about the social determinants? Okay, We know that wealth, education, employment, you know all this, so I don't have to tell you where you live makes a difference. How far you commute makes a difference. Okay, What are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to suggest in two minutes that you fundamentally have to disrupt American society. How do you get Republicans and Democrats? By the way, the um, most underrepresented group in this room is Republicans. You know, if we can't form a relationship between Republicans and Democrats to advance the agendas that we're interested in, we're just going to be marginalized, period. We have got to figure out how to put these two different political philosophies, but groups of people who I think care about people, most of them on both sides of the aisle, care about people together to try to figure out what we're going to do about this. And I'll come back to that. So if I were you, what would I do? What do we know about medical intervention? First of all, Innovation is good, but it's expensive. It's the only field so far where intervention and innovation has increased costs and not decreased costs. Look at your computer, look at your camera, look at everything you have. But medicine has wound up becoming more expensive. People die in costly ways. What are we going to do about it? So one of the really interesting analyses that were done at RAND, which has not gotten enough attention, is if you pay more money for drugs now, overpay for drugs, it increases health of future generations. Maybe you can disagree with the facts, read them, see if you agree or don't agree, but let's assume the fact is correct. Do we want to do that? Is that a strategy we want, or can we figure out a different way of improving health of future generations? So we can build on what we've learned, and we can act on some things immediately. So here are very simple things that I think we ought to all do. If we really believe that social determinants requires working across silos, regardless of how efficacious it is, why don't we require parents to produce their child's report card at each visit? Period. End of sentence. Why don't we make that part of our business? If they don't do it, spend a minute saying, that's more important than anything else I'm going to do. Maybe we ought to teach pediatricians and family practitioners and nurse practitioners and others what to say when they get the report card. Okay. I think we should urge parents to demand weekly feedback from their child's school about whether the child missed class, didn't turn in an assignment, flunked an assignment. Not every six months or a year. Now here's a really interesting question. When this study was actually done to show that it worked in train, change schools, there were two groups of people in an IRB that said the following. Is it ethical to do this? What if you go into a poor community and give parents 
knowledge that their child missed school, flunked an assignment, and the IRB said, made up of people that are not poor, these parents are gonna beat the hell out of their children and we're just gonna increase child abuse and Dick will have another reason to get national funding for child abuse. A liberal philosophy? Conservative philosophy? What if you ask the question the other way? If you give poor parents without training or education feedback, nothing else, cheap. Maybe even somebody can get the computer system in Los Angeles school system to actually work. Could, what would they do? Well, so far, some of the preliminary results that are now being published suggest that it works, that poor families actually can use this information constructively, period. So in the 60s, when Johnson was advocating the Great Society, there was a housing experiment done. The housing experiment randomized families, poor families, nobody really wants to see people live on the street, to getting the money directly versus going through a social worker. Same sort of, you can imagine the same sort of conservative liberal debate. Well, they did an experiment. Guess what? Giving the money directly to people resulted in them having better homes at the end of the study than if they gave the money to the social worker. Now, I think we ought to start a movement, a revolution, not an evolution. You should not work in any health system that does not know how many people it serves. Ask the head of the UCLA, she's gonna be here tonight, how many people she served yesterday? Will she know? How many people died in the last 24 hours at UCLA? In the health system. First of all, they have to know what a health system is, but let's say they know that, ask them that. I guarantee you won't have any more conversations. <laughs> How many people died a good death or a preventable death? Either one. You want them not to have a preventable death, and you want them to have a good death. Do they know that? Why not? I just told you we've had 50 years of health services research. You all contributed to it. If we can't answer these basic questions, what are we doing? How about the health status of those that are alive? Well, that's pushing it a little bit. I, I might. And how about those people not to work in a health system that doesn't have some plan to affect the social determinants of health? Produce the plan. What's the plan? How much money did they spend? Now what if when you interviewed for a job as a resident, you asked these questions? What if you went to Harvard? What if you boycotted the place if they can't answer the questions? Now I have a younger daughter who did that in the legal profession. She basically asked the question of how to build a better legal profession. So she used publicly reported data to gather information about women equity partners and minority equity partners in the prestigious law firms around the country in big cities. She found that there were firms in New York and Boston that had zero minority partners, zero women partners. And she then started a movement with her colleagues at the top 15 or 20, whatever it is, law schools, went around the country and basically convinced them to join the movement and not interview at those firms that actually didn't have any women or minority partners. She did this at the height of the recession when lawyers were having trouble getting jobs. How much sort of gonads do we still have? <laughs> we need disruptive change. Now, if we integrate measurements of health status into a healthcare system, we need to pay attention to loneliness, social isolation, and despair. I just recently uh, got a little piece published, hopefully to be published in, uh, in JAMA, which I don't know whether it's right, um, that asks the question, should health be redefined to include a measure of hate? Can you be healthy and intolerant? 
So one of my friends, I ask people these kinds of questions. One of my friends is an oncologist, and I said, Should, is it part of your job to ask your patients that you're treating for breast cancer anything about intolerance or hate? Well, he said, I don't know, but let me tell you a story. The last woman I saw a week ago, while giving chemotherapy to, to her, said that she had a lesbian as a daughter, and um, she was going to disown the daughter. And, uh, and he stopped the chemotherapy and spent a half hour trying to tell her in simple terms that he, she ought to judge the character of her daughter and not who she slept with. He had no idea whether he was doing anything right or wrong or whether it was effective or not, but he thought it was his job to do it. Now, others believe that if he does that, the woman will never come back to finish her chemotherapy because she'll be turned off by medicine, and it's inappropriate for medicine to do that. I, for one, believe that medicine has, given what's going on in the world at the moment, that medicine has got to take a lead in doing something. What I've suggested may be terribly wrong, but you're all much smarter than I am. Come up with something better, but don't come up with something that is nothing. Come up with something better. What if we eliminated differences in quality of care? We've talked about this by doctor, nurse, or health system. Now, there's a really important problem about transparency. It's one thing to have implicit knowledge, implicit, that you go to a doctor or a health system that's worse than another. It's another if it's explicit. What if I tell everyone that lives in Spa 6, and if you don't know what Spa 6 is, ask Loretta, that the healthcare systems in Spa 6 kill you at five times the rate that, than UCLA or Cedars or anybody else. And I make it explicit as opposed to implicit. Can our society hold together? Or have you not seen anything yet in terms of the kinds of actions that are occurring on our streets? Remember, Martha Luther King talked about the greatest form of, of um, injustice is healthcare intolerance. What if cities and individuals had trusted analytical tools that allowed both to thrive? We need to get away from doing individual projects to complex policy projects. Nobody wants to fund it. We have to change the NIH entirely. Nobody wants to fund it. Nobody wants to fund somebody that looks at things from education, health, housing, and whatever. And just talk to Ken Wells for a little bit about the difficulties had trying to get such things funded. We need to change so that we can develop trusted analytical tools that, that can be used by individuals and cities. We need to eliminate the effect of geography on everything. We talked about the social determinants of health. And finally, we need to, we need to dramatically alter care as delivered to achieve value and control costs. Those of you got to remember that the way we differ from other developed countries in the world is we spend an extra six to nine percent of our GDP on health care versus any other country in the world. Now, we have an 18 trillion dollar uh, uh, GDP in the United States. That's how much we produce each year. Multiply 10 percent by 18 trillion, six percent, whatever number you want to use, that's a lot of dollars that could be used for a lot of different things. Do we want to continue to spend the amount of money we spend on health care the way we spend it? Are we getting good value? Do we want to increase the value? I'm not saying we should decrease the money, but we certainly should know the answer of whether we're going to be different from every other developed country in the world. We've already, we're moving towards trying to, uh, to educate doctors for a value-based culture. Um, I think we should eliminate schools of medicine, public health, nursing, and dentistry, and just replace them by a school of health. I think the most important thing that we possibly could do is develop a culture where we respect and trust each other. And to do that, we all need to be in the same school, begin our education in the same way. Now, another ridiculous idea, but come up with a better one. What if the marginal income tax of the middle class and wealthy individual depended on the homogeneity of the community in which they lived? Uh, tell Beverly Hills in 10 years, you got a 90% marginal income tax rate, and all your money goes back to the government when you die. No foundations, no charities, US government. 10 years, you have to have a community in which it's your, the population in Beverly Hills is representative of the community of Los Angeles. 
What would happen? I learned a story again from my friend over here, I won't tell you who's about, that Japan has a policy that says if you live in Japan for five years, then 90% of your wealth as an expatriate goes to the Japanese government, so everyone leaves at the end of five years. Or four years and whatever, 364 days. Stupid idea? Would Republicans and Democrats agree about it? I'm not saying raise taxes, because you can reduce it on those people that are in communities that are integrated economically. Now, you ought to all do one other thing. If Martin and Joel are gonna lead one activity, pick two of you to lead another activity. What if all new policies that we passed were evaluated on whether they reduce variation in health? I'm amazed there's not a single organization in the world that has the responsibility of looking at the responsibility of state, federal, county, government, regulations, all this stuff that many of us hate, some of us like, but what impact do they have on reducing variation in health as opposed to changing mean level of health? And which work and which don't? And how do you make that message available to everybody? So what if we were the catalyst of change, eliminating every wasteful dollar, spending it on animals, ecology, the earth itself, come back to the thing, we can improve everybody's quality of life. And last but not least, the, there's nothing new. Those of you that like the New York Times, read Modern Love. Compare it to the stories in the Bible and the Old Testament. Nothing much has changed. <laughs> sisters still hate sisters. Brothers still hate brothers. Mothers and sisters, brothers and daughters still have problems. And finally, as all of you know that have followed what I've told you to do, be humble. It's not about you. It's about the future generations. And in case you have time on your hands and I haven't made you more uncomfortable than I should have. Here are a bunch of books you ought to read. I believe, and I'll be happy to, Browell will send you the list, it's all available. Um, my top 13, there are others that are probably better, but think about what you're doing, how it relates to the rapidity of change that's occurring both in biology and in Silicon Valley, and try to figure out how you're gonna look, spend a little bit of your time a little bit. I know you have to write K awards, get funded, bring food home, feed your children, have a house and do all that. Spend 10% of your time being outrageous. That's why you were selected into the program. You're a bunch of passionate, beautiful people. And it was said before, the future of the world is dependent on what you in this room do. I really believe that. Um, it's been a really fun job to have a little influence on you. I hope that uh, um, I, uh, that 27 years from now or 100 years from now, uh, your children and your children's children will benefit from what you do because what you do is the most important thing that can be done in the world. Thank you very much.